Kabbalah. Uh, Professor Ao Wang, you have uh, recently published uh, a book about Kurt Gödel, yeah. which is also translated in French. Um, could you please uh, describe your way to Kurt Gödel? How did you meet him? When did you meet him first? Uh, I met Gödel for the first time in 1949 came to his big office, in those days he still had a big office. Uh, then in the 50s I went to his house uh, to have tea with him. 1956 I think was in uh, August 1956. And then we corresponded uh, over the years. But was in the 60s I wrote a paper to discuss Colum's work in which there's discussion about Scullum's partial anticipation of uh, Goethe's uh, completeness theorem for predictive uh, logic. And Goethe responded with two very long letters explaining how his work differed from Scullum's, but also talking more generally about how his uh, Platonism was important for his mathematical work. Uh, these uh, letters are uh, later on published in my book From Mathematics to Philosophy. Mm -hmm. And then in 1971, we decided to have regular meetings. So I went to his uh, office, usually on Wednesdays, every other week, we have two and a half hours discussion. And I took notes of these discussions. This lasted for about a year, uh, from October 71 to December 1972. Then in uh, 1975 and 1976, uh, he invited me to be a visitor at the Institute for Advanced Study. But then we mostly talk on the telephone, sometimes five times a day. Uh, also, the phone conversation sometimes lasts last one or two hours each time. So there was a great deal of uh, conversation uh, in 75 to 76. Uh, in fact, those are the things I'm trying to work out with this next book on with conversations you. with Gerda. Yeah. It will, that will be the title, uh, Conversation uh, with Gerda. Conversations with Gerda yes. would be the title, or Philosophical Conversations with Gerda. Professor Gandhi, did you meet uh, Kurt Gerda? No, never. I, <coughs> I, I, I wanted to go to in, uh, Institute, and I wrote some letter, and he obviously didn't approve. And I realized that, you see, I was a student of, and very much influenced by, even before I was a student, by Alan Turing. Mm -hmm. Now, I realized later on that his way, his style, was so different from Goethe's. <laughs> Turing liked to use homely examples and uh, put things in a way, in a slightly eccentric way. <laughs> and Gödel, of course, liked to be very precise. And, uh, and no doubt this letter I wrote, I mean, it was just, I've forgotten what it was now. I know it was about the Delta One Two hierarchy, uh, but there was something that was vague and wrong about it and so on. And maybe I wrote it, I can't remember, never mind. But, at that stage, the difference in style, I think, was when I think if I'd met Gödel, I should have thought, oh, oh, he's, <laughs> he's trying to punish me. <laughs> uh, did did uh, Turing meet Gödel? No, 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 he didn't. Never. I think I never. No, 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 never. No, I'm trying to write. The people who didn't meet each other mm -hmm. is very extraordinary. Uh, Turing never met Kleene. Uh, uh, no, which is it? Church never met Hilbert. No, I, I forgot. The whole, when you look at it, it's extraordinary. The number of people who are interested in something who never so met. So <laughs> May I ask uh, to you both uh, the following question? Which aspect of uh, the work of Good Girl do you prefer personally? Ask him first. I suppose I prefer all his work because he already made a selection and mm. what is important. And I, I find uh, his selection very continual. Mm -hmm. So therefore, uh, 
But since there are more work uh, done about his mathematical work, so I tend to concentrate on his philosophical uh, ideas, especially because ma most of that have not been published. So uh, I find them both interesting, but since the mathematical work, the implications and content is well worked out, so I th my own concentration is on, on the philosophical Philosophy. thoughts. Mm -hmm. right. uh, I, I think there are two things that impressed me. One was his discussions in the beginnings of recursion theory, I mean, the notes he gave, and then his rejection of ch his pointing out to church that the arguments weren't good enough and so on. And he, he played an important part there, and I, I, as it were, I think he was right. And of course, when Turing came along, he saw that that was a good analysis. And I, I must say, the other thing, of course, uh, uh, incompleteness plays a part in my logical life, but in fact, it's the set theory <laughs> part that exci excited me most. Uh, to begin, Turing said, oh, you, ought, uh, oh, you ought to read this. He never read it. <laughs> you really never read it? Well, he, he certainly didn't know it at all well. When I told him something out of it, he said, how extraordinary. <laughs> I, it was a long time ago. I, actually, I only read it, read it seriously much later. Um, but uh, no, that, that for a long time, that was a very, very big influence. If you want me to go on, you can always cut it out afterwards. There was a conference in 1958 in, in uh, Reading in England, and How Wong was there, and Shepherdson, and one or two other people. And I realized <laughs> that if you use the, the Gödel condensation arguments, you had minimal models for set theory. And I thought somehow one could make something out of this. And they said, oh, no, no, that's, that's not getting anywhere. <laughs> then Cohen actually made something out of it. I, I was too weak to make something out of it. <laughs> um, may I ask you what? What was the most remarkable property of his character? Uh, the most remarkable, I guess, uh, precision mm -hmm. and uh, and also the uh, ability to concentrate on what is fundamental. Uh, in fact, later in his life, he was very apologetic. He said that you know. I always, uh, always want to do the fundamental work. As a result, of course, I neglect many things and also I don't publish enough. This was uh, in the 70s, he was saying. He, f he was seemed to be questioning whether it would not have been more fruitful if he had uh, been willing to deal with uh, less fundamental questions. And then, of course, also because of his preoccupation with precision, he became very frustrated in doing philosophy mm -hmm. because in philosophy you cannot <laughs> attain this level of precision uh, which he is uh, accustomed to. Yeah, I think those... Yeah, precision. Yeah. Um, could you say something about his sickness, about his psychosis, uh, uh, about the early crisis in Vienna? Do you know something? Yeah, the, the literature I know usually came from his brother, uh, Rudolf Berder. Uh, one of the things uh, Rudolf mentioned was that already when Goethe was four or five years old, he has had some kind of neurosis, anxiety neurosis, because if his mother went away uh, for too long, mm -hmm. he got very nervous and so on. But uh, I guess the first thing which uh, uh, Rudolf mentioned was already in 71, toward the end of 71, just after his most famous paper was published in the beginning of 1931. And then, uh, according to Rudolf, he had, uh, Gutter had a nervous condition, was contemplating suicide, and so on. Uh, then, of course, in 1933 to 1934, he went to uh, Princeton for a year. He was very lonely there. Uh, later on, he told friends that he, he was very lonely. Of course, 
uh, at that time she was not married yet, even though she was already very close with uh, Adela. Uh, and of course, Adela did not go to Princeton with him. So he, when he came back from the US uh, in the spring of 34, he had another breakdown. Mm. And then, of course, in 1936. Where, where did he go uh, after this breakdown? Uh, did he go to, to the hospital in Vienna? Or? I'm not sure. I was told he was, was he uh, treated. Or he was treated by this very famous uh, Wagner Jarek. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Wagner, Wagner, Wagner Yes. Not treated. They, he just looked at him. I don't. He didn't treat. Oh, I see. Mm. And, and then he may also have gone into the infirmary that time. I'm not sure. Maybe go to the sanit sanatorium. Oh, that's right. That was, I was coming to that. Of course, he was very nervous. Mm -hmm. The June 1936, mm -hmm. when Schlick was murdered, because mm -hmm. he was quite close with Schlick. Also and, uh, oh, died that's right. Died. Yeah, he also mentioned specifically Hein died in 34, just mm -hmm. when he came back to Vienna. Hein uh, died of six then. Mm -hmm. This is when that. And then uh, this crisis became uh, more difficult in, in America. In the 50s and the 60s and 70s? That is not very it's clear. Not clear. In the 70s, of mm. course, uh, then uh, toward the end of his life, mm. apparently became very acute, mm. partly because his own health was bad. Mm. And uh, especially uh, in 77, I think Adele's wife had to be put away because of her sick sickness mm. for about half a year. Mm. I think that was very bad. This was pro roughly from July of 77 to December mm -hmm. for almost half a year. Uh, Gerda was basically living alone mm -hmm. and that was uh, certainly was very mm -hmm. bad for his mm -hmm. uh, both physical health and mental mm -hmm. health. May I ask you now uh, both uh, uh, the mm -hmm. relation, uh, Professor Gandhi, uh, could you say something about the relation uh, between uh, Turing and Wittgenstein and uh, Gödel and Wittgenstein, possibly. I see. Well, uh, Turing went to Wittgenstein's lectures, and he was the most vocal member of the audience. Mm. These were recorded in '38. Now, one or two things, which I'm surprised you made. Did you go to no, to no, I, I never met Wittgenstein, <laughs> but uh, they obviously were guys came from the uh, the text that they regarded each other with some respect. And, a little, a little careful, a little wary. And, uh, uh, Turing at one stage says, if you were asking that question, Wittgenstein, I should say the answer was Aleph Nort. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right, yeah, I but that, but. <laughs> I, I, I wish now, of course, like anyone who's known <laughs> someone who, who dies, that I'd asked Turing more questions. But I, he, I asked him once about the lectures, and he said, oh, well, Wittgenstein had this idea about an internal property. And Turing said, I think I convinced him there was no such thing. Now, this is totally untrue. Wittgenstein stuck to the notion of internal. <laughs> and uh, you made a conference uh, this morning about... Uh, oh, y Adel yes, and, uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, Goethe said specifically he only met Wittgenstein once. Uh, he was never introduced to Wittgenstein. Mm. Uh, and he said, think that was in a lecture, uh, Goethe said it's the lecture by Brouwer, the lecture I mentioned this morning, this is uh, March 10th, 1928. Uh, the, uh, so that was the only time. But at the same time, uh, Goethe belonged to this, uh, the uh, Schlick Kreis or the Vienna Circle. They discussed the Wittgenstein Tractatus very extensively from 1926. Did he appreciate the, the Tractatus? Apparently not. He, he did uh, make comment, I think, in this paper, I even quoted him. He said that this gave a rounded picture. Uh, so it's a well-rounded picture. So in that sense, it's a good work. But at the same time, he also commented and said that he doesn't think that in Wittgenstein's Tractatus, you can accommodate universals, mm -hmm. these objects, uh, can only sort of uh, apply to particulars. So, so therefore, 
Gardner said that if that's the case, that shows this theory is not work, mm -hmm. is not right, does not work because you couldn't take care of universals. Uh, about the later work, of course, Gerder did not read very much, uh, but then he, of course, read the parts about discussing Gerder's own theorem and thought that was completely uh, uninformative and confused and so on. The, the point of view of Wittgenstein. W Wittgenstein's view on uh, discussion of mm, Gerder's theorem. Was confused. Confused and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. not really, he mm -hmm. said, he did not understand mm -hmm. the, the theory, or at mm -hmm. least pretended not to mm -hmm. understand mm -hmm. that he said. Mm -hmm. This was in his letter to Karl Menger, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and of course, uh, on Wittgenstein's side, of course, uh, as we know, he have discussed extensively Gutter's theorem, uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, yeah, Gutter was thought that he was, at first, he wanted to prove metaphysics not possible. And then, according to Gutter, later on, Wittgenstein, later Wittgenstein was trying to prove science is also not it's possible. impossible, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> This interest uh, of Gödel for um, philosophy, how did it come about? Uh, wa was it always there, or was it uh, development? Uh, was it a, uh, did he turn to philosophy at a certain yeah, moment? Uh, do you know? Yes, I think no. I I think it was uh, very early because he said that already in 1925 mm. he was a Platonist. Mm. In other words, he, was, uh, he attended uh, lectures by uh, Heinrich Gompels. 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 Heinrich Gompels. And he was very influenced by these lectures. He, mm -hmm. he said that the lectures at the University of Vienna, which influenced him most, are those by Gompels and the number theory, number theory lectures by Futwangler. Those are the lectures he specifically mentioned he was influenced by. Mm -hmm. So therefore, also in the 1930s, he studied the German idealists very carefully. Mm -hmm. in, in the 30s already? In the 30s already, he was studying uh, Hegel, and uh, in fact, uh, Karl Menger reported on that. He even pointed a passage to say here, Hegel anticipated the general theory of relativity. Hegel? Hegel, yeah. yeah. And, uh, but, uh, he was Hegelian. Hegelian. Uh, uh, no, I don't think he was Hegelian, but uh, he was, uh, uh, of course, he was, uh, studied Leibniz. Mm -hmm. uh, he was already in the 30s, he was very enthusiastic about Leibniz, and from 1943 to 46, according to his own account, he concentrated on studying Leibniz's work. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, beginning 1959, he began to study Husserl's work. So his uh, interest in philosophy uh, had begun very early, very early when he was about 20 uh, years old, I would think. Mm -hmm. Because even when he originally he studied physics, even when he studied physics, uh, he, when he first entered the University of Vienna, his specialization was physics. This was ah, yes. 1924. Mm -hmm. But already half a year after he was there, he borrowed the uh, uh, Kant's book called The Foundation of Natural Science, uh, borrowed from the library because in the record of what he borrowed. So th therefore already could see his interest in physics was already philosophical. Mm -hmm. He wanted interest in the foundations of physics mm -hmm. rather than physics itself. Mm -hmm. So therefore I would say that uh, his interest in philosophy was predominant ever mm -hmm. since he was in college. Mm -hmm. In fact, the reason why he, he only began get, to get interested in logic in 1928. And then there, I think he felt that here is a place you can do precise mathematical results which have philosophical significance. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he himself emphasized that on the one hand, his work was helped, his mathematical work was helped by his philosophical position, mm -hmm. what he called the objectivistic point of view, or mm -hmm. Platonism. Mm -hmm. That was his 
argue his letters to me that that help him to get his work. On the other hand, he also thinks his work in turn sup supports this objectivistic philosophical position. So not only his interest in philosophy as such was uh, long standing, but even his mathematical work, or see his work, also including his work on the general theory of relativity, his solution, again, was motivated by philosophical interest. So therefore, uh, it seemed to me the philosophical interest for him was always, was, was always there, but then he wanted to be able to see something precise. That's why he uh, moved into the fundamental mm -hmm. science mm -hmm. in order to combine mm -hmm. both sort of precision with philosophy. That's mm -hmm. his way of combining uh, his interest in philosophy and his interest in precision. Mm -hmm. May I ask you about, have you ever spoke uh, with him about Freud, Sigmund Freud? Uh, yes, he, uh, this was in 1972, I think, or, or yeah, 72 or 75, 72. He was talking about, uh, he wants philosophy to be a theory, and this kind of theory is quite complicated. Then he observed that uh, Marxism is, uh, so genetics, for example, is a theory. Mm -hmm. uh, physics, of course, Newtonian physics is considered as a, a, the paradigm of a theory. Then he said, but then he said that Marxism is not a theory. Uh, I didn't ask him to elaborate. But then he said that Freud's work, if you read it right, interpret it right, it's a theory. As the way Freud presents it, it's not a theory. Mm -hmm. But Goethe thought that he knew, he knew a way of presenting Freud so that it would be a theory. Then he, in fact, basically offered to discuss Freud with me. But at that time, I was a Marxist, a Moist. <laughs> I was not interested. In <laughs> I was a Moist. I was, this was in the 70s. Yes. I was not interested in Freud. So I just changed the topic. So later I regretted I should have mm -hmm. discussed should Freud have. with him. Uh, she must have thought much about Freud's work. But I can do you, uh, did you read Freud? Yes, I, like any one of my generation, I think. I mean, I, I read the interpretation of dreams. Then, and I, I, uh, I, 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 I noticed instances of the psychopathology of everyday life in myself. I once had a wonderfully Freudian dream, and then I analyzed it for a week. You didn't, you didn't <laughs> undergo an analysis? No. Uh, uh, the fact of the matter is, I, I, Actually, the, the analyst I knew well was a Jungian analyst, and he said, you undergo analysis, you're the most stable personality I know of, so <laughs> it was out of the question. And later on, the, well, it was just over the Freudians, I knew several psychoanalysts. And Whom did you know, for example? I, uh, they were children psychologists oh. in, in Hampstead. <laughs> I don't did you, think did you know Melanie Klein, for example? No, no. But it was, it, it, it just got overemphasized, and then, and of course, it also became uh, the, this word of Kreisel is rather fond of using now of anything he dislikes. It's an ism. <laughs> Once something is an ism, <laughs> you don't want to have too much to do with it. So. But, but, but there are, there were insights. Did anybody of you read Jacques Lacan? Me, Jacques Lacan? I, I read some of his work. I you, you read some? Yeah, I read some of his work. But what I did you read? Oh, let's see uh, what was, I don't even remember. There was also a dictionary edited by some fo followers. Uh, yes, 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 and, uh, and I, I did, uh, in fact, he, uh, You read Lacan, some of his work? Yeah, I read some of his work, but uh, uh, actually, I think it's around 1950, I did go to see a psychoanalyst, because that I was, uh, so we knew in America, and then I was belonged to something called Society of Fellows. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody in the society thinks uh, himself as a genius. Mm -hmm. So about two thirds of the people are going to analysts because they're <laughs> well, genius. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, one friend there urged and said, "You must go see an analyst." Um, mm -hmm. And so on. they finally there was a student of uh, Freud's actually. I forgot his name. He was at Harvard Medical School. Finally, uh, he 
keep on pushing me. I said, all right, I'll make an appointment. Mm. This man so busy, finally he was able to see me January 2nd, I think it was uh, <laughs> uh, 1950. Mm -hmm. uh, it was in New York? Or in New York. Uh, no, in, in Boston. In Boston. Boston yeah. 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 Uh, there was a couch, mm -hmm. still the old fashioned. I lay on the mm -hmm. couch, mm -hmm. just asked me to talk, just freely, or, or freely association. So afterwards, it, in those days, the charge was $50. Uh, I certainly couldn't afford <laughs> going there <laughs> regular for <laughs> $50 a session. Also, I felt $50. that $50 dollars a oh, session. Very much money. Yeah, but it's just uh, also that the fact that a lot of my problem, if I had so much money, my problem would, would many of my problems <laughs> would be <have been> solved <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so I did not continue. May I ask uh, <coughs> you, uh, each of you, uh, something about your actual work? Uh, you could resume uh, in your, your conference of this morning or something yeah, of the, the, the problem or the, the actuality. Yeah. All right, so quickly. Of course, as one gets older, technical work comes harder. I have <coughs> one good idea, which <coughs> Kerner referred to in his lecture, about how to interpret the infinite in the finite. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, it went very well. But unfortunately, the interpretation is not sound for the quantifiers, and I, something is wrong. Right? So, all right. So that's something I'm really interested in. Comes from uh, I mean, thoughts from long ago. But 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 I just say so. I'm working on a notion of sequentiality in higher types with a student, and that I think will finish. I think that will come out quite nicely eventually. But because I'm stupid, so I now spend more time thinking about history and about philosophy. The trouble about history is that. I mean, there are some people who are natural historians. They find new material. And not, I only know the published stuff, and then I forget what I read. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it is an interest. It is. Well, when I was younger, it was not an interest. It is an interest. But Professor Wong, I have a question: Whether Gödel ever talked with you about his visit to psycho psychoanalysis? No, never did. Mm -hmm. He never talked about that. No, no. he didn't uh, undergo. With Hulbeck in New York. Uh, yeah. I didn't know that. With whom? In Germany with Hülsenbeck and he also Hülsenbeck, wrote Hülsenbeck, was a Dadaist. He wrote a psychiatrist, it was a psychiatrist. He became a psychoanalyst in New York. Yeah. He became a psychoanalyst. He says everything inside. Yeah. 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 He never discussed that with me. No. Uh, could you say something about your uh, actual uh, yes, uh, research? Uh, yes. Uh, my own work, uh, I like Robbins. Uh, I always wanted to do philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, doing mathematics always was some way of showing I can do it too, but mm -hmm. never wholeheartedly did any mathematics. Uh, so uh, for the last uh, 25 years or so, I basically concentrated on philosophy. And uh, my current work, uh, in fact, for the last almost 10 years, I've been trying to uh, work out these discussions with Gerder, the conversations. The reason why it's taking so long is that I'm trying to compare his view with my view in order to, to put down my own philosophical position. In other words, one of the way I want to describe what I'm trying to do is that I would like to find a general framework, a philosophical framework, within which the Goethe's work, Wittgenstein's work, would be only sort of a small part where I would have this general frame uh, that in which the different philosophy, different approaches can be put in. Uh, so that would be my, uh, preoccupation or also I guess that would be work for the rest of my life mm. and try to develop that. Uh, How does uh, your, your own culture, Chinese culture, interfere in your thinking? Yes, I have mm -hmm. thought much about that. Um, I think one of the difficulties I have, uh, I'm not even sure it's just a Chinese culture, it's just 
in a sense, even in Europe, in fact, I keep on saying that. Up till the time, say, Leibniz or Kant or even Hegel or Marx, they were able to know basically everything known at his, their time. Mm. But no, nowadays, nobody can do that. That, I find, is the great uh, difficulty with philosophy. My Chinese background is that in China, the traditionally, or is the generalist, the one who is, is regarded as the most desirable, the specialist, uh, oh, just technicians, and so, and that gets very deeply into my sort of way of thinking. I know it's, it's almost like a disease. I want to shake it off, I couldn't. Mm -hmm. Because as a result, of course, my work uh, is kind of, I tend to do things which require much more effort and in a way gets less recognition because if uh, you do specialized work, it's very easy to get recognition. Mm. I mean, as my own experience, for example, I did something with computer theory, and so I get all best jobs, best offers, and so on. Mm. But if that was only something did with my left hand, so to speak, but when I really do something very seriously, mm. then of course <laughs> I don't get that much <laughs> attention or recognition. But since that's what I want to do, so I mean, to answer your question, there is this uh, this. Uh, striving for kind of a, a general outlook to go beyond specialization and also in the Chinese tradition we combine philosophy, literature and history. They are supposed to be one big unit and that's also what I desire to do. Mm. Of course it's very hard mm. and then of course only recently I was also trying to somehow the fr big framework I'm looking so that even the Chinese philosophy get a place in this framework. The West <laughs> get another place there. So, so in that sense, I, I guess I'm very much influenced by this. Uh, Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.